uh, in the field in Africa, in Asia, uh, as a researcher to begin with, and then as a, uh, a civil servant, as the chief economist at uh, then DFID, now FCDO. And I think that's brought together kind of a wealth of knowledge and experience that's to try to understand why countries like Indonesia have done really well, whereas others like Nigeria less well and Malawi less well. And the kind of central premise of the, the book and the idea is that there is a, essentially the elites in any country, including this one, uh, control uh, many things, capital, land, uh, often mineral resources of the army, and they have to be convinced to go for what he calls a bargain to promote development and growth. And it's not a foregone, you know, think, you'd think everybody would want to do that, but clearly that's not the case. And what he does very cleverly in the book is to go through the reasons why some countries, and often episodically, so not continuously, have gone for that bargain. And just to sort of, you know, lay plain how important this is, um, the International Growth Center, which is uh, sponsoring this event, which I'm a, the director of, has had this concept of setting up offices in Africa and Asia to help you know, give advice to countries about growing. And when I read Stefan's book, two countries sprung to mind. The first, well, not a country, state, Bihar, uh, jumped into my mind because Bihar in 2005 was growing very, very slowly. The, the former chief minister had been put in jail, obviously was very corrupt. And then this new chief minister came in, Nitish Kumar, and he did a whole bunch of things. But basically, including proving law and order, uh, appointing 200,000 teachers, building roads and bridges, he managed to convince the population, which is not small, about 100 million people, that he was the development candidate. And in order to implement all those reforms, he appointed civil servants, Indian administrative service officers, to run the government. And Bihar jumped from a sort of 1% growth rate to a 10% growth rate. So imagine that for 100 million people moving. There's no, as far as I can see, no, no particular advantage of Bihar. It's landlocked, got no, no, no minerals, huge population densities. But somehow that turnaround, he, he basically set out a gamble on development, which the population accepted, which as you can see, he's still chief minister to 2005. <laughs> Uh, and it was really striking that he was really saying this is no longer caste-based, this is about development, and these are the things that you can see as citizens. So a couple of things about tonight's, so that's just to sort of throw into the mix the central premise of what Stefan is talking about and how important it is, because it means, A, there's hope. You don't need some historical advantage or some endowment in order to, to develop. You can do that if the, the elites essentially agree to uh, to make that happen. So in terms of the structure, what we're going to do is we're going to have, we have Mona here from, uh, who's the former uh, deputy finance minister in Ghana, and she will come in after Stefan. So Stefan will present uh, his book basically and the, you know, what's in it. And then Mona will come in and then we'll have a, a bit of a discussion about the book and the central ideas there. Um, and then we'll uh, go out to you guys and collect questions, both from the people in this room and online. A couple of things on housekeeping and so on. Firstly, this is sort of part of a series of events uh, to celebrate uh, Arthur Lewis, who was the first uh, black academic at the LSC and uh, uh, appointed to the faculty, or was a student and appointed to the faculty, won the Nobel Prize in economics, very much focusing on issues that, such as what Stefan is looking at. So it's part of, part of the reason that this is part of the uh, series of things to celebrate him. But also we wanted for people to sort of pay attention to the uh, gambling on dev hashtag. So if you wanna join on Twitter and so on, that'd be great. And then finally, I think um, we're gonna have a survey at the end. So please fill that in. Uh, to, so we get feedback on, on the event. I think without further ado, can I invite Stefan to make his presentation and then we will. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. So, so look, it's, it's great to be there. And, and look, I, I was kind of encouraging people to still to come in and squeeze behind me. I don't mind. It's actually not more, not, nothing more fun than talking to a, a room that's full. And, uh, and it's nice to be back with in front of people and be able to talk to all of you. So I will briefly present some of the, the central premise of my book. And as Robin was trying to allude to it, 
This is for me, this was a book I was trying to get kind of the, my, a bit like things in my mind that they couldn't quite square together, which is on the one hand, 30 years of working as an academic, you know, very much in the vein of the kind of things that Robin was doing, looking at micro development, trying to find things locally, understanding what's going on. And then meanwhile, or towards the end of the last 10 years, working in government as a chief economist and traveling around the world and actually hoping that people would use some of the knowledge and the evidence we have that actually gets him put in practice. And there you see this huge diversity in performance, but you also meet all kinds of characters and personalities. So this book is not an academic book. I think there's some, 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 hopefully some interesting passages as well to actually there. In fact, much of the book, in fact, the core chapters in the middle of the case studies, they were initially back to the office reports. They're much better written than they were at the time. Back to the office report at DFID, trying to inform the development agency in the UK, you know, like what's going on in the country and what can we, how can we fit in with the things we're trying to do? So, so it talks a bit about aid, but this is not a book about aid primarily. And, I'll, and that will become clear in a, in a moment. See where I can get this to move. Slowly, maybe. <laughs> Patience, I don't know. Is it? <laughs> Thanks for free. I'll keep on talking. I'll keep on talking. So, look, so one of the things that, that you know, there's been this massive progress in the world. Okay. And so we shouldn't forget that. The last 30 years have been remarkable in terms of the progress, in terms of, of extreme, um, in terms of the um, you know, in terms of extreme poverty. So extreme poverty has gone, oops, uh, extreme poverty has gone down by about two thirds. And yep, there we are. Um, can I use it now or not? Yes. yes, I can use it now. And so look, and we know that kind of stuff, you know, and there's, there's these countries where a lot of progress is happening. And the red is there, there's the number of extreme poor people using the World Bank definitions. And basically, you know, first, we were in 1990, probably about 2 billion people and it went very fast down uh, over time, first in East Asia, that's the red there. And then in South Asia, especially India, somewhere after 2000, we see these declines happening as well. And then we have the blue, which is actually Sub-Saharan Africa, where we actually have that sense that things, well, if anything, the number of extreme poor people is at best staying stagnant and at worst actually gradually increasing. In fact, the new poverty numbers are coming out uh, or they came out last, last uh, weekend, I think, in the World Bank. COVID had added probably about 150 million more people to, uh, to extreme poverty, although there's been some recovery. So we're talking about 70 to 100 million more people than we thought we would have had by now. So we basically went back five, six years. That's actually quite helpful to know. Five, six years in the poverty uh, in, improvements that we have. So I don't want to give up hope that this progress will be there, but you see there the difference. There's a lot going on in the Asian countries and very little than in Africa. But even in Africa, there is heterogeneity. There's different things happening. And it's, it's great to have uh, Mona here on the, on the line because actually there's two countries in Africa that actually have been able to halve the number of extreme poor people, starting from relatively high levels, more than 20% in 1990, and at least amongst the larger countries, it's Ghana and Ethiopia. They actually managed to halve the number of extreme poor, poor people since 1990. And now you have a bunch of countries that include definitely whatever data you use, Nigeria and um, Madagascar and the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the number of extreme poor people is doubling. Now, it's, it's a one important thing. Africa is not a country. There's a lot of difference going on there. And that's actually also something I wanted to think a bit about. It's close linked to growth, okay? You know, and it's not because I believe in Liz Truss, even though until May, forgive me, I was advising to her on development. I was a total failure. Uh, but I fortunately resigned in good time. Um, but, but it's not trickle down. But it's basically, it's correlation. It's not about that the growth will cause the poverty reduction fully, but without the growth, we never see it happening. And that's also why the growth story is so important. Uh, why the growth story is so important here. And you have these stagnant countries like the DRC. Yes, that it seems to have been a bit better over the last 10 years. Yes, it's a bit better over in the following terms, but it now is about a third poorer than it was in per capita terms in GDP than 1970. Well, 10 years ago, it was uh, only, um, sorry, that the level of GDP per capita today is only about a third 
of what it was in 1970, while 10 years ago it was only a quarter. So it's improved a little bit, but it's still dramatically worse than it was by 1970. You have Nigeria that has a nice little hump and seems to have done at some point briefly very well, although I think I know more or less what happened because I remember going as chief economist to the statistical office in Nigeria when they were revising the statistics about 10, 12 years ago, uh, when I asked them, uh, did you give any instructions from the president in terms of the revision of the GDP figure? I said, no, no political interference at all, as long as we will be bigger than South Africa. And, um, and then you have other countries where generally change has been happening. India has managed to catch up with pro growth uh, patterns uh, that, that actually Vietnam had. And actually, both of them are moving quite, quite, quite strongly in, in this broader period. But then we also get Bangladesh much poorer than, than, than some of these other countries and then actually progressing. Bangladesh especially I find really interesting because this is a Muslim country where my very first essay in development economics was, give, was I was given the title, a quote from Henry Kissinger's aide, is Bangladesh a basket case? And I said, yes, nothing will ever happen. This was in the early 1980s, because that's what we thought, nothing would ever happen. Bangladesh has grown, has halved its extreme poverty and beyond it, has improved its health indicators, uh, especially for girls for a Muslim country, quite remarkable and so on. So these are the kind of countries where something happened against the odds while we have others where very little happens. And of course you have the China, but China is such an exception. We shouldn't keep on staring at what happened in China or even in Korea. These are such exceptional countries for, of which actually the developing world can't learn that much, except for one thing, and I'll come back to that. So the question that a lot of people keep on asking, and I step into that tradition, but arguably, let me say, try to be a bit experiential in terms of what I was experiencing on the ground was happening. And especially because the big theories that some of these guys have all talked about. I know this is a good pop quiz. Do you, how many do you recognize here and how much do you score? You can quickly have a look. You know, how many, how many do you recognize and think of yourself? And I'm going to slowly come a hint, you know, and uh, oh, these are the books, you know, many of you will have read them. If anyone has read them all, then I would say congratulations, but actually they're worth reading. They're worth reading, but they have very different views. They don't give the same views. Okay, and so, so, you know, what is it that these books have in common? So now, the one thing that these books have in common, and I find very striking, is that they to focus on what we love to do as academics, telling countries what to do. This is what you should do. These are the policies you should be doing. This is what you should not do. Now, as academics, we have something to say about. And as an economist, I think I spent a career trying to do this. But it doesn't answer very well for me the question then, you know, you know, what are the big diagnoses and, and what's that behind us? Now, we have a very big one that's very powerful, influential, and I have nothing against it. In fact, I think it's a really good one, which is basically the institutional economics dimension, where I basically say it's all about the institutions. You know, Asim Ogley Robinson, why nations fail, you know, the kind of thing. And I think it's really important. It definitely matters. In fact, you know, Leonard Wanshikon gave a lecture. He's an economic historian, economist based at Princeton. He comes from Benin. He, he basically gave a lecture at Yale recently. He said 50% of what we see now happening in, in Africa, it can be explained by that theory, by these theories, uh, institutions. Now, 50%. Okay. The problem I have with institutional economics, if we take the evidence really seriously, they tell us that all these things are shaped slowly through history. That is basically these rule, the rule of law, the institutions, the political system gets shaped in history. For example, if you then read Why Nations Fail, you, you know, and of course uh, the politicians are served loved it because they said as long as you look like Britain and the offshoots like America, then you'll be successful and all the rest will be crap. And, but it's even worse. If I go, and this is what I was definitely conscious of after David Cameron instructed us, I did it, to start going around the world that that's the book we should all focus on and put in practice. I felt very uncomfortable to be with the advisors of President Buhari in Nigeria, because if I take the advice seriously, best I can tell them is that the evidence tell me, tells me that Nigeria should get a better history. It's a bit hard for a British civil servant to go and tell them that. So it's not quite the way you can do it. So it's, there's a lot of truth in it, structures, colonialism, all these things matter. But remember Leonardo's uh, point, 50%. So what's the rest? Well, 50% is actions, what people do, what those 
in countries are doing? What are the policies? In fact, these books are full of advice. You know, if you read the Paul Colliers, it's a long list of all the things that you should be doing, very confidently written, and it will all work. Or you, you have similar in Danny Roderick or in others, very clearly descriptions of this is what you should be doing. Get the policies right. Now, it's quite an interesting thing here when you start thinking about, because when you start looking at the countries that have been relatively successful in the last 30 years, they definitely didn't have strong institutions. You know, China was an absolute mess in 1979. It had come out of the Cultural Revolution, Mao's death, and then the Gang of Four struggles. In fact, I remember as a young, as a young kid, people talking about, will China survive this? That's the moment when Deng Xiaoping actually dumped ideology and went for pragmatism. It doesn't matter whether the cat is white or black as long as it catches mice. And actually saying that that's what you can be doing, something very, very different, a radical change in the direction of policy. You don't do it when it's strong, you do it maybe when it's weak. Bangladesh started doing this in the 1960s, after, sorry, 1980s, after it had a terrible 1970s, with, of course, the war of independence and a lot of uh, turmoil. That was great for them, but then the famine followed straight afterwards. And then you had all the political upheaval and the founder being executed and coups and chaos, nationalization, the economy stalling. It was an absolute mess. It was a basket case, as far as we could see. That's when actually Bangladesh started change, changing. Now, and if you don't see what they do, it's not rocket science. They don't, unfortunately, go and get us a list from, from, from people like me and say exactly do the first, the first best perfect things to do. They muddle along a bit. They do things, they do things. In fact, Michael Spence wrote a really useful report. He's not a Nobel Prize winning economics. He wrote a useful report, a growth commission report. But it's actually quite amusing when you read it. It's best known for the line, we don't know the recipe, only the ingredients. But it comes down to, if you read the chapter on macroeconomics, you say, ah, sometimes it works with a fixed exchange rate, sometimes it works with a flexible one, and sometimes it, it, it works with overvaluation, sometimes it works with undervaluation. Now, that's not very precise in advice that you give. Similarly, they say infrastructure matters and education matters and health matters, but they don't say it exactly. Or put it differently, the range of things that these countries that were successful were doing is actually a bit broader than the first best that we like to actually talk about as academics and try to explain and do things. Put it slightly differently, the question to ask is why don't they try to actually do some reasonable policies? And the question really in countries is, the more important question is not, do they do exactly the recipe that the IMF or something tells them, but why don't they try to do something reasonable? And so what the big difference is between the countries that, uh, that ended up being relatively successful in recent times and those like the Nigerians and the DRCs and the Madagascars that seem to be going nowhere is that actually the difference is one group tried to do something reasonable and did something in that process while another bunch didn't. Now, why don't they do these things then? If there is space and scope and you actually have choice in terms of what to do, why don't you do it? Now, for me, that was brought home very strongly when I was working as deputy as chief economist and one of the joys of the jobs was to be told, you know, oh, look, you should come, prime minister's office would talk about, would like to talk about the plans of development they were going to have. So this is on the left-hand side, the DRC, prime minister's office. On the right-hand side, it's the Ethiopian prime minister's office as well. In Ethiopia, there are no pictures to be found of the prime minister's office. There's a security issue there. It's a slightly different type of regime. Let's say in the DRC, they didn't give a damn. So they, um, they invited us and they allowed us to actually listen to the development plans. So we were in the DRC in a group with, you know, young, well-dressed, we're all men in this case, but, you know, well-dressed young men giving us the development plan of the prime minister upon you at the time. So it was about seven, eight, no, well, probably nine years ago now. And so they give these plans and they explain these plans to us. And actually, I must say they were really good. The agriculture plan, I thought that was really a good plan. And the infrastructure plan was sensible, the way that we're going to out of dollarization, it made sense. And it was like this whole morning of presentations, I gave comments, we said, look, that's actually pretty good stuff. In fact, it was all very reasonable. Washington would have been pleased, but it was still enough localized that it sounded like, oh, this is a really Congolese plan. And I remember walking out of the room together with my Congolese colleague from the embassy, and he said, quel uh, spectacle. Basically, what a show we've just seen. What a show we've just seen theater. Because we both knew nothing would ever happen. We had the perfect plans, but nothing happened. In fact, the day before we had been at the Minister of Budget, which is different there, the Minister of Budget is separate from the Minister of Finance. So the Minister of Budget, the finance spends, and this is making the budget. And the budget minister had been so pleased with himself because actually uh, he thought next week we're going to get a budget through Parliament. 
okay, the budget actually of the current fiscal year that was already in its 11th month. So they would this year succeed in getting the budget approved before the budget year has finished, which I had not achieved in the last three years before. So, you know, that's the place. In Ethiopia, we're invited with a similar setting. Uh, actually, we had we asked to bring some experts, and I remember actually um, we we had in the room, in fact, John Sutton here was at the time at the LSE, retired now, wonderful man. We had Paul Collier there, Lan Pritchett, and Justin Lin. Okay, so if you know some of these names, Justin Lin, former chief of the World Bank from China, Paul Collier, you know his own you know own thinking, uh, John Sutton, very much from another kind of thing, and I was there in the room as well, and Lan Pritchett, you know, Lou Scannon totally, but anyway, you could you could have him in the room. And it was really interesting. So they were presenting the plans and they wanted comments. And I remember we had loads of comments because that was really tricky economics. And, and I remember thinking, this is really sailing close to the wind. I'm not a macroeconomist, but I thought, you know, wow, this is really going to create troubles on the macro and see it. But I do remember also coming out and agreeing amongst all these very different experts to actually say, you know what, they're going to do this, isn't it? They are going to do this. And they probably will succeed. In fact, since this is about eight, nine years ago, in fact, Ethiopia had 7% growth between 2003, sorry, 7% per capita growth between 2003 and 2020. That will have been the fastest growing economy, I think, outside China in the, in the world in that period. And that's really interesting. And what's the difference? Well, I think I've come actually here with a book that's always worth reading and looking at again, the last book that Douglas North wrote, and it's basically on violence and social orders. But he basically talks very lyrically and very clearly about, you know, how do you think of a state? Well, the state, you know, we have the quote there, is basically a dominant coalition of elite groups that actually agree to stop fighting with each other, but actually saying, if we work together, cooperate, we'll probably get more out of it more out of it, and not in political fame, but also more resources, more rents, more access to the control and the resources. In fact, I think it finds, having worked again in the top, in the front office of the foreign office the last two years until May, yeah, that's how it works, as Robin was alluding to, that's how society works. You know, you have a bunch of people, a dominant coalition, that basically decides who gets access to the state, who gets access to resources, who, how is it actually working, okay? It's a bit like what Manker also, Manker also talked about when societies emerge, when they move away from roving bandits to stationary bandits. And you get the cover of my book now. Um, and you basically get that. And now, I think that's how you look at the state. And any state we have, I think we should be willing to look at it as an elite bargain of those with power, okay? Who are the ones with power? That's not just the politicians. I think the mistake made often by international agencies, they only talk to the minister. And they only talk to the key person. No, 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 actually, societies are a coalition of power. Politics involves economics, involves money, involves the economic business elite. It involves often the military as well. Even public intellectuals, senior journalists, even civil society, basically the elite. That's the end. Basically, any state can be seen as a coalition at the minimum of stability amongst these elite. Okay? And then on top of that, it tends to have a political deal and an economic deal. You know, and it's not like in Douglas North and Wallace and Weingast that it's only, only in poor countries where they look a little bit dodgy. You know, just think of our own underlying elite bargain that we have in our Western societies, which comes down to if you have an ancestor that happens to be carrying the sword of a Norman knight in 1066, I think there's a good chance you're still a millionaire. And basically inheritance rights and the way we have them and land rights and inheritance rights, that's part of an elite bargain. Parliament could change that overnight, but we have no interest in doing it. We think they deserve still to have these, these rights. That's part of our elite bargain. So every society has something about the political deal, who owns the state, who controls it, and an economic deal, how it's happening. Now you could have lots of them. You could have, a bit like us, a bit dodgy at times, but overall functioning. Uh, you could have maybe a very kleptocratic regime like Mobutu Sissoko had in, the, in, in Congo, in, in, in Zaire at the time, where he basically, you know, enjoyed um, basically setting up a state that whose main purpose appeared to be to steal from everybody and then divide amongst the close group of people. Or you could have, which is more common, what sometimes people call a near patrimonial state, a distributive politics state, where basically, uh, where you could have clientelism ruling. What's clientelism? Basically, if you, you, you reward those who keep you in power, 
you give jobs to the boys, you give, uh, you give uh, rents to the businesses that are financed your politics. You could have lots of things. And I think lots of societies have multiple elements. And the main point that I want to bring down and bring, bring to the core in the book is that don't take for granted that every society you meet will want growth and development. Don't take that for granted. In fact, our societies here probably moved somewhere late in the 19th century, or maybe even after the First World, or maybe even after the Second World, or properly towards that this is the right way to looking at your society, growth and development. And so that you actually get these things. So, and we look at in these societies what it is. And, you know, and I think fundamentally, growth and development seems to happen, not where you have perfect institutions, yes, that counts for 50%. But 50% is agency of those who have control and of power. And those that agency, when it gets used for growth and development, you'll begin to progress. Maybe not South Korean growth rates, not development indicators like in China, but you will start progress. That's actually, by the way, the only thing we should learn from China directly. The amazing commitment they suddenly had, elite commitments after 1979, that growth and development was important. That's what we also find in, 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 uh, in, in, in Korea at some point, but not immediately. And we find that in different societies. And this is what I think differentiates, I write in the book about in the different cases of where it is different and the periods that it happened, you know? And we'll, you know, when do we know it's happening? When people start really attacking and addressing fundamentally something that keeps it all ba back. And it will involve vested interests. It will involve, um, it will involve basically being willing to start addressing something. It will not involve immediately moving to first best and the best possible institutions, but actually beginning to build and do more. Anyway, so you need to have three things in place. You need to have an elite coalition that generally wants peace and stability. You know, remember I say it's like the first thing of a state is actually a coalition for stability. It's an elite commitment. So it does mean that within the elite, Whenever someone tries to actually have a long-term horizon, you don't totally try to upset it in the short run by, by getting them up on the street to actually do your stuff. That would be an idea of a, elite, a fragmented elite that is actually not committed. You have to be self-aware of the state. Why do I say this? Because there's a lot of people that still think, oh, you have to have a developmental state. That's the only thing possible. No, no, no. You can do a developmental state, say, in, in, Southeast, in, in East Asia. For example, in China, where you have 2,000 years of meritocratic bureaucracy, where you have 2,000 years of centralized taxation, where you have 2,000 years of a well-defined uh, borders and, 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 and a country, and you have a state that actually is potentially quite strong, institutionally quite strong. You're not going to do that in Malawi, where the state is essentially from the beginning built up as a clientelist state, as a reward for those people who are getting it. How do you think? that state will actually ever do it. So you need to find another model. This is what Bangladesh did. It didn't do it by the state. In fact, it denationalized a few things because it clearly in the 70s was screwing it all up. And they did not that much, but people sometimes told me when I was in Bangladesh in June, actually the fertilizer market liberalization may have been a very crucial moment that they actually didn't do it a totally in a controlled way. The fact that they stopped the, 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 the building up of state or the enterprise, that they didn't stop the garment sector when it evolved in the 1980s. It actually allowed it to evolve and actually quite independently. And when they didn't think that they had to be the only ones that could do education and health, in fact, when they recognized that organizations like BRAC would do an amazing job in social sectors. And actually, they rec you know, BRAC is the largest NGO in the world. Robin has done an excellent work in studying on this. It's the largest NGO and it's a very effective organization. It's a bit like a state within the state where you see them operating. I actually had just one thing. Would India ever have allowed this? No way. India would never have allowed BRAC to be as big as this. Would any African country ever allowed to do it? No. Would any country in the world actually ever allowed to do it? No. And that's actually quite striking. Bangladesh did it because it was self-aware enough that it wasn't going to do it itself. It didn't stop it. And then you have to have, of course, correction mechanisms, internal, external accountability. It's interesting where Mona is on the line, and I'm going to wrap up very quickly now, is that actually the idea of, of you know, if you're China, and you have no external accountability, okay? So nobody votes you in and out. Although someone once, she was the translator of President Xi, she was my student. She said, we have a democracy in China, 
but it's 7% of the people who have a democracy. And I thought that was actually a good specification of what it is. 7% of the, of the population basically the members of the party. There is internal accountability. Okay, there is internal accountability, at least there was definitely in that period. Let me not comment on today. But there is, there is that. Now, that does mean that you can actually progress in that state that is meritocratic has internal accountability. So you can actually function because, you know, it's probably the first, organiza first organization that I know that introduced results-based financing. Because basically, you know, if you didn't deliver as a local level official, you know, the results mattered. And in fact, you, were, you, you lost your own finance, i.e. your job, and, uh, and you would be out. And so somehow the incentives were aligned internally. But if you have a state like Ghana, if you have a state like Ghana, where you don't have a state that's built up historically like this since independence, it's quite clientelist, I have to admit it. There's corruption, there's issues to do with that. It's very hard to get lots of uh, stuff to function. You need at some point have an error correction mechanism in your society. Actually, democracy does it. Actually, the constitution that was very, in some sense, restrictive that Jerry Rawlings introduced in the 1990s and restricted it that you couldn't have, which was really the, the problem in many of these countries, but you can't have parties competing in the elections that are actually regional. They have to be cross-regional. They have to be across, they have to be cross, essentially cross-ethnic. So you've already made sure that every party has to be a coalition that goes across ethnicities. And then you fight elections, but then the political elite after 1990s constitutional change was actually very smart and actually said, okay, we'll play the game. And we got stability, political stability, and lots of turnovers, I think seven or six or seven more, and correct me, changeovers of, of, of party or who is in charge, and you create external accountability. And actually, it created the opportunity for, for, for uh, Ghana to grow and actually be remarkably successful. So this is my list of countries. I'm not going to go too deeply into it. You can read the book. But, you know, um, oh, yes. The one thing I want to say for my wife, and when I'm finishing with, with a few comments on age, is to actually say, you know, for the elite, this is a gamble. Elites love the status quo. Elites understand the status quo. They know exactly how that works. They know exactly how to keep in power when everything is the same. It makes it quite remarkable that you'll get actually so many societies at some point gambling on progress and actually wanting to grow. You could do it maybe because you're under threat. You may lose your legitimacy. So whenever there is a bit of a crisis, this is the right moment that may help you explain why so many elites that were got a bit concerned had to actually start changing it. It definitely is change the case in China. China may well have imploded and actually chose to go for growth and development to keep legitimacy with the population. And so you get that in, in other countries, Ethiopia, Rwanda, we definitely have legitimacy seeking behavior. Similarly, can come out of conflict. Most of the time when you come out of conflict, 90% of the time, the best predictor of what happens after conflict is more conflict. So very hard R squared if you run the regression of explaining conflict with past conflict. But actually, occasionally, an elite say, maybe we shouldn't do this again. Like that happened in Nepal, when actually the elites withdrew from conflict. And actually the elites, the Brahmin elites, basically made a deal amongst each other to actually say maybe, We'll have another way of doing this game. And you have a slightly different elite park in a bit more inclusive, not brilliant, but they're doing better. Anyway, what can outsiders do? Well, if you have a country that actually is committed to growth and development, actually, this is where we work well as aid organizations. This is where we can do what we did. And in fact, that's kind of the interesting thing. Everybody's saying it used to work so well. Why doesn't it work? Well, no, we went around the list of the countries that had a good development bargain. We were working, Ghana and Bangladesh hugely benefited from it because they wanted also to use it well. In fact, my, one of my predecessors, uh, Steve Economist, Adrian Wood, when I asked him once, where has DFID ever been most effective, the aid organization here? And he said, oh, it was in Western China. They desperately wanted to succeed in Western China. That's probably where DFID was most effective because they wanted it and then they do it all. This is a, and places where they have a development bargain, you know, that's the place where you bring in science. There's a place, place where, you know, we do our experiments, we work with good civil servants to do it. And I think that's the experience of the IDC. We can find these people to work with. The problem is once you come to the Nigerias of the world. So what's the point of it? I say, oh, there's lots of people suffering. Like DFID has, you know, endless programs, probably a billion eight in, in Nigeria because on health and all the things, because the health outcomes so bad. 
You can try to do good. But there's the one thing that I get really worried about is, aren't we just going to embed the elite even further? You know, Nigeria is the country that spent the lowest share of its budget on health. Meanwhile, all the donors keep on spending on healthcare because yes, the health indicators are bad. If you do this for 60 years, at some point they start wondering, what the hell are we doing here? Are we actually allowing, uh, doing this? And it's a hard one. I'm not having an easy solution, but we're definitely not developing that country. We're doing good, maybe humanitarian, but we want to be careful. So what we do, well, I think I'm going to stop. You know, if you want to act, you know, don't think you have a silver bullet in these places. But there is something that you will totally unlock, you know, anytime I got so tired of them working in different, when there was another one saying, I have this wonderful thing that gadgets is going to solve everything, or another academic paper that they were going to solve the food security crisis in the world, no doubt. Right? But basically the advice is if you see a development bargain emerging, that's the one to gamble on as well as the international community. And feel free to be able to feel, do good in other places, but just be very, very careful. And I think if we don't understand what's going on in a country in the politics, as as technical as academic advisors, we must be very careful because we may end up sometimes doing harm as well. And we want to be very careful. Okay, I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I think what we'll do now is we will turn things over to Mona, who's the former Deputy Finance Minister in Ghana. And Mona, what I wanted you to do was kind of to put on your gambling on, de on development glasses uh, and tell me, you know, with those glasses on, did this, did this kind of make sense of what happened in Ghana? Because for me, at least for a few countries like Myanmar, Bihar, it sort of jumped to me that this really was what happened. I mean, both in terms of the bad times and the good times. But in Ghana, does this sort of resonate with you, these sort of this prism of gambling on development or not? Thank you, Robin. Um, I hope that I'm clear. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Thank you, Robin. And thank you for that presentation, Stefan, and some of it, you know, information out of Ghana. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, yes, when, when I put on that hat, a, a lot of the things that have been said resonate with, with what has happened in Ghana. And I think that um, having an underlying commitment to development from the elites is very important, as has been shown by, by Stefan's um, study. You know, growing up in the late 60s, 70s and 80s, I felt then and strongly believe now that those were indeed the lost decades so far as Ghana and Africa's economic performance goes. You know, we, we just went through so much chaos and we lost out in focusing on getting our growth rate up and getting the elite on board. So it was a period of low and in some cases even negative growth rate. It was a period of political instability, a period of near farming. I remember when we would queue for uh, staple food, including even bread. Generally, there were poor living standards and there was a lot of desperation for most of us. Um, I was in high school and then into college at that time, a lot of desperation. And this was all due to a series of military coup d'etat starting from 1966 until 1982. And as Stefan mentioned, 10 years later, 1992, we went into democratic governance. From 82 till 92, our mantra in Ghana was accountability, transparency, and probity. And as much as it was a mantra, it got drummed into our minds. And during those 10 years into the early 90s and mid 90s, um, I think most of us who were influencers as described by Stefan, the elites, uh, whether ruling or non-ruling, uh, bargained to, to help with growth. We needed it, we wanted it. There was nowhere else to go but up and we all got on board to make this happen. Even with that, our national development was fragmented and sporadic at best. So um, like I said, the economic challenges, the rampant civil strife of the time occasioned some crisis and many Ghanaians, uh, moved on to greener pastures, 
although in recent times we've seen some of them come back from as it were the diaspora back to Ghana to help. But a lot of people moved during that time. Then for some of us, uh, the new millennium really ushered in a new sense of hope. I mean, here we were in a country that now found oil and gas, added that to our gold and to our agrarian economy, which was basically selling our cash crop cocoa. We demonstrated that democratic governance through free and fair elections, as best as could be, um, generated some capital. So there was democratic dividends, there was political stability, which Stefan referred to, and that stability really helped us to attract foreign direct investment and to build up local capacity to facilitate our growth. And I believe that somewhere um, in the mid 2000s, we had a growth rate as high as 7.4%. Of course, subsequently we haven't hit that again. And in recent times, uh, we saw an improvement from 2016 into 2017, close to 18. And now, unfortunately, it's going back down. In fact, it's projected at about 3.5% for this year. So Ghana, I must say, was fortunate to discover those the, the additional natural resource of oil and gas, new sense of hope, a bright future. And we, we definitely did open up to international best practice. We had mechanisms in place to ensure resource governance. We amended our Minerals and Mining Act. We also added on to our laws, the Petroleum Revenue Management Act and how we spent that petroleum money. Because as you would recall, a lot of people were wondering if we would get the Dutch disease where we had so much money like Nigeria that would overspend, become so corrupt and then go back into the doldrums. That hasn't happened yet. And we've all been very aware of that. In any case, it was with little wonder that growth in the 2010s were markedly different from what we've seen before. These changes were made possible because the elite, that is the politicians and the managers of the economy, the ruling elite largely understood the need to change course. We couldn't do things the same way anymore. It's also too important to understand that the relative successes that Ghana chalked over the recent decades have been both planned and coincidental in some respect, as described in some of the other countries that Stefan re referred to. So um, perhaps unlike China, um, it hasn't been totally planned, but we've also had some successes out of coincidence. So that is my initial submission. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to have a quick sort of conversation between Stefan Mona and myself and I guess since it's the LSC we don't, uh, we don't let people off lightly so I'm going to ask a slightly sort of probing question about um, essentially the, the fact that in Africa if you graph out per capita growth rates as Mona was saying you had kind of some initially fairly high growth rates in the 60s in the post-colonial period and then a tumbling down of growth rates in the uh, 70s, 80s, and beginning of the 90s. Now, the question is, and then the, the rise of Africa in the 90s, 2000s, 2010, and so on, is why would you see, it looks very um, common, you know, that many countries are going up, then going down, and then going up again. So why would, why would that happen? I mean, were, were, were there some sort of, coordination on many countries deciding not to gamble on development and then gambling on development, or were there greater sort of geopolitical forces that were pushing governments in different directions? So for, for both of you, if you have any sort of thoughts as to why that trend was so common across many countries that are quite different political regimes and even former colonial masters. So, so okay, so I have a first go at that is, is you know, and, and referring back to actually what uh, Aaron Aiwan Chacon would be saying about, you know, structures versus agency, there is definitely a sense that in this first one, first decade after independence in Africa, you, you were definitely, you know, under the weight of, the, of, of history, so to speak, you know, a lot of tendency to actually do not sensible things, uh, you know, commodity prices did strange things in the 60s as well. The, the, you know, you got all these kind of pressures. And so you get that first period, like the 20 years, 
that actually somehow may have gone lost, where in Asia they were they were beginning to, you know, they were stagnant, so, so to speak, but it wasn't that kind of total decline. But then in the subsequent period when you refer to, I think we must make a distinction between those countries that were natural resource exporters, that by their sheer weight in the data seem to dominate all these the growth cycles. And then the non, non, non the non um, exporters, I think the non uh, natural resource exporters. It is a fact, and actually, even in the way I talk about it, is that we should recognize that if you have natural resources, the status quo is even easier. So there is really very little incentive to do anything else. You know, Nigeria is fundamentally still totally, you know, the oil biasing everything. A thousand people probably in the end providing rents to a hundred thousand people in society. You know, you don't have enough for 200 million people. If you divide it amongst 200 million people, you get $500 per capita. If you divide it amongst 100,000 people, you have a million dollars per capita. And so that's more or less the elite bargain of Nigeria. The status quo is so easy, okay? Because then you have something, you don't have to do anything. And I think that's the big wave as well. The Africa rising was misleading because there was a lot to do with the commodity prices. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, the super cycle as people were referring to it, but it was just so good for these kinds of places. But none of them really did it. And uh, while at the same time, you have amongst those who are not natural resource exporters, you have the Ghanas, the Ethiopias, the Rwandas, actually maybe even the Tanzanias beginning to do something. And so you have the gamblers there in it that are actually trying to find a turnaround in different ways. So I think we largely find them amongst the non-oil exporters or non-natural resource exporters, but definitely not all. Think of the Sahelian countries where there's still an awful lot of stagnation. Uh, even if they don't have natural resources, some of them. So, so I think I would more explain, and is the differentiation, especially after about 95, between the, the natural resource ones that dominate the graphs, and then the kind of the beginnings of, of the differentiation in, in, in the other sense in Africa. Mona. Yeah, what I'd like to say is that, you know, I'm sure you've heard many times that Ghana is the darling of the IMF. Um, we always make them look good and they've always been out to help us. I mean, it's been, we, we've been to the IMF about 16 times. Why do I talk about us going to the IMF? It's because one would notice that anytime we are under an IMF program, and we've been under several times, we do quite well. We do very well. We just came out of one IMF program and we went into one um, April 2015, and the fruits were beginning to show up in 2016, 2017. It was clear inflation was down, our growth rate was going up, debt to GDP was coming down, compliance on tax revenue was doing well. By the time that we were hit with COVID, we realized that we were not that resilient as much as we thought. By the time other um, headwinds hit us, we, had to, we, we are now in discussions with the IMF again. It will be our 17th time. So we are a natural resource, rich natural resource country, but we tend to spend not so wisely when we work on our own. And unfortunately, it looks like we always need someone to hold our hands and to guide us to do the right thing. And that's how come we have a gyration or some volatility in our growth rate. You see us do well and then not do so well. During the times that we are under programs, we start to do well, we start to show the fruits. And um, unfortunately, we are back into discussions for another program with our debt to GDP over 80%. And, and, and things are not easy again in Ghana after looking so good in 2017. So it, it's still fairly volatile, but over time, we now have a generation who understand this bargaining chip from the elite into development, who understand that we cannot continue to have vices like corruption, continue to mismanage our economic books, and continue to, to be, as it were, rent-seeking type people and do well. Those have been our three big challenges. And we now have a generation that is saying we won't accept that any longer. We believe that when a country does well, or a nation does well, 
its people will benefit from that and do well too. So we are seeing them coming on board. So for example, I look at my sons and daughters who are in their twenties and I see them wanting to see Ghana do well. So they are no more so much personal growth, but national growth. And in the past, there's always been the talk about, listen, let go of the personal and let's have strong institutions that can help build a nation. I'm glad that Stefan has talked about countries where strong institutions didn't necessarily do that. It's the will of the people, the will of the influencers, of the elite and so forth. So we are seeing a generation coming up, almost like the Arab Spring situation, almost like the Sri Lankan situation, where they want a nation that will do better. They will um, gamble on that and they will invest whatever they have into that so that the nations, um, whatever benefits accrue to the nations will also trickle down to them. So clearly uh, we need to grow our GDP. How we do that um, depends on us. Everyone's solution is different. There's no cookie cutter but definitely there is best practice to guide us. And we need to start looking at some of those things because I think we are at a point where we know what is good for us. We know the levers that will help us to grow. We know the growth poles that we need to attach to to grow. We understand the urbanization. We understand ICT and we understand what growth drivers will get us there. And it's up to us to now make that happen. So um, yes, the, the gyrations, the volatility in performance has been a result of sometimes we getting over um, excited about uh, the wealth that comes into our kitty and then realizing that it goes fast and we need to have systems in place that will help us to sustain our growth, sustain our debt levels and sustain or even grow our revenue. So that's, that would be it for us. Can I add something on the yeah. IMF? Because Mona made a really interesting point there. And it's in common with quite a few of these countries. Okay, so, so let's contrast, you know, Pakistan is going into its 23rd IMF program, of which 22 have failed. Um, and then actually have more the way Mona talked about the use of the IMF. It's very similar to how Bangladesh did and Indonesia did that. It's basically... And I think those who follow the news in the UK, they know suddenly why we have an independent national, uh, how we and why we have an independent central bank in the UK. Okay, is to correct when your government can't control itself for political reasons. Okay, so actually you can think of it of the IMF in these countries as in a, as a as a bit of an extension of an independent central bank, and it basically provides a kind of a, a correction mechanism when politically you can't really sort it out, when the rent seeking gets too much, or even politically you can't sell it. So that's why it's really useful that the whole LSE is full of people that lambast the IMF, because that's actually useful that, that you have the, the, the ones that are saying you are the baddies here, because politically that allows your, your politics to function. So Indonesia played that very well, including you know, some later on became senior people in the IMF in the World Bank, uh, but they were in the Ministry of Finance that Ghana did as well, Bangladesh did this sensibly. Pakistan does just the opposite. So basically, they never complete the program. And Mona is correct, you know, most of these countries, when they come out of the program, actually the correction has happened and actually growth begins to pick up. Yes, there is then the pressure, sometimes political cycles, other cycles that it actually depresses it. Indonesia managed to do this better maybe than Ghana thus far, but Ghana, I'm, it's, I'm really confident that they will get there. But, but just basically see them, if politically you can't handle the correction yourself, treat you, this, this becomes your independent central bank. This becomes the equivalent of the Bank of England for this trust. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, Mona, you were very eloquent about uh, something. It's a bit like McKinsey for government. Yes. Uh, you know, coming in and... Uh, saying, you know, you're doing bad stuff and we're going to close you down if you don't. Uh, yeah. But, but I, I, another question, and then we'll turn it to the, to the audience, which I, I, I gather has been a growing during the uh, lecture, which is fantastic, um, which is obviously, I remember a while back, I was on a panel with some of the people you were talking about, Jeff Sachs, Billy Stilly, Esther Duflo, and it was some poverty conference. And, uh, and they all said stuff about how to fix development and that. And 
at the end of me and Esther turned to each other, we said, we have no clue um, how to fix development. Uh, you know, we'll try to figure it out. We really have no clue. So, I, I mean, I like the, the part of your book, which was, I guess, reasonably humble in saying it's a kind of a muddling through process and I don't have, a, have an answer. But I guess turning that around, you know, part of the criticism of why nations fail, very difficult to extract a policy message from a book like that. Very nice read, but, you know, what the hell do you do with it? So I guess for both of you, if you take this book, uh, which definitely doesn't have a sort of silver bullet feel to it, it's more a kind of better reflection than description of what might have gone wrong and what, if you were suddenly, you know, plucked out of your uh, pleasant academic sabbatical or wherever you are and placed back into uh, the chief economist role at, say, the World Bank, what would you say when you went to Ghana uh, or, you know, chief economist at IMF about what does your book say about policy? So um, I'll have two chapters on it, uh, <laughs> the last two chapters. But I think, so in the first instance, I just want to encourage everybody to have a simple framework in mind, which is, you know, we're economists, we think about incentives. And what are the incentives for those involved? And how could we influence the incentives for those in the elite to actually go for, you know, if you think of a multiple equilibrium world, to actually move to an equilibrium that is actually a coordination around growth and development versus an equilibrium that is the status quo where it's distributive uh, rent-seeking kind of thing. How can you as an outsider change incentives? So I, 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 the, the humility is an important part because we are outsiders. You know, Mona has more chance to change it in Ghana than an outsider has it. But we have a few instruments. So the one thing I would actually say that I'm really getting more and more excited about and interested in is, um, you know, it used to be the case, and we know that in East Asia and Southeast Asia, that international trade was a real opportunity for that. You know, international trade is a really good one also for political economy reasons in the following sense. If you need to compete with the world, you can't screw up at home. You can't just do it all with connections because your product, you can't have uh, shortcuts with safety rules because you can't sell it internationally. You have to do all kinds of things. So an economy that's export oriented, it's not just because you learn from the world, it constrains your political economy. And there's a bit of political economy work, there's a couple of papers that allude to that these days, but I think that's a really important thing that actually the political economy constraining role of, ex of international trade. Now, the problem is that we're now given up on that internationally. Okay, so seem to get the, so the, the positive incentive would be more trade preferences, more encouragement of these things for political economy reading. But how do we actually get, we, we, can, we still have now one thing, and actually it's thanks to Ukraine, and thanks to the fact that Western countries, despite all appearances, are still rule of law countries. And I do remember it from inside the FCDO, is that we've now, at last, been willing to start willing to actually change, not just go after Russian oligarchs, but actually we need to change the laws. And actually in the US and in, in, in Europe, and in Britain even, the laws are being changed now against illicit finance. Now, I hate it always the focus on tax havens because for poor developing countries uh, like Nigeria and Ghana, sorry, not Nigeria and Ghana, Nigeria and the DRC, I was never intending to try to give a lot of money back to Buhari or Mubutu or to Kabila. That's not what I want to do. I don't, it's not about foregone tax. It's actually to understand that a lot of the odious politics in these countries is financed through illicit finance. Because without the illicit finance, you can't keep these networks of politics going in Nigeria. And so we have an opportunity. I would actually, maybe not sure it's the World Bank, but this is our, the next 10 years, if we want to make inroads. And I'm actually beginning to get optimistic that it could be as big as the trade stuff that we used to do for these countries. Totally un, you know, un, undoing all these things and, uh, and, the, and creating especially the impossibility for new of these kinds of regimes to emerge and doing it. So this morning, I would simply give it away. It's like I was talking to someone in Bangkok of the transitional government or the temple, whatever they call it, the revolutionary government of Myanmar, you know, they're in exile. And basically, you know, they were asking, you know, where do we focus our sanctions work? And I would say focus it on Singapore because without Singapore, Myanmar couldn't exist. 
And that's actually only listed finance. And so you start working on that. So that's, that's the one thing. In country, I would do all I can to strengthen the monas of the world. So you're basically, as you say, the influence is there. Have in mind who are the ones that actually have, not just in a naive way, the good of the world in, inside, but actually are cunning, connected, smart enough to actually invest in and see whether they can actually keep the, what you were describing going and supporting it. And actually, you mentioned the IMF. Probably the best thing that the IMF did in Africa, beyond the occasional correction, was strengthening central banks. We now have actually really competent central banks across Africa, and we have competent finance ministries. And that's actually not the World Bank, but the IMF has done an amazing job in, in doing that. And, and these kind of things, mm. targeted smartly thinking, not just any capacity building, targets on the right groups, the right institutions, the right, the right groups. Mona, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah. Um, talking about strengthening the central bank's monetary policy, um, I agree with you, Stefan, the IMF has been very helpful in strengthening the Ghanaian central bank. Um, if, I don't know if you recall, um, in 2016, we came out with the Public Financial Management Act. We spoke about um, government having zero financing with a plus 10% um, room or leeway to be able to borrow from the central bank. And that has that worked well. In fact, all of 2016, there was zero borrowing from the central bank. In as much as central banks in developing countries, especially like Ghana, have been strengthened, we've also seen very strong fiscal dominance. And I know that's tautology, but there's been fiscal dominance. I mean, so that the central bank is there to do its work, but the fiscal pushes it. And why so? It's because of budget deficits, persistent, relentless budget deficits, excessive expenditure, mainly not on capital expenditure, but consumption. Um, I think that if you look between 2012 and 2016, very partial here, there was a lot of infrastructure development in Ghana. There was a lot of capital expenditure. Unfortunately, since 2017, we've had more consumption. And the give me system, which was given to us by the World Bank, which is an excellent system to make sure that ministries, departments, and agencies don't overspend their budgets, have been, um, as it were, overruled too many times. And therefore, we've gotten back to where we didn't want to be, where we were working out of the hole. So fiscal dominance continues to bug my nation, Ghana, and it's because of political will. It's the, the ruling elite pushing against the rest of the elites. In Ghana, we have the ruling elite, the non-ruling elite who hold capital, private sector, the media who are very strong and recently now have the Right to Information Act that has been passed, and I believe they are going to use it strongly. And then the fourth sector is the civil society organizations, and they've been extremely vocal, and it is to um, the benefit of our nation. So these four big influences, and what we see is that the ruling party always pushes much stronger than all the other three, but there is an increase in strength of the other three, and I am hopeful, I'm always hopeful for Ghana, that we do have a bright medium-term future, and the people's will, because what is economics about? It's about the people and their standard of living. So the people's will will eventually trump. So um, we'll see how, how that goes, but um, I'm hopeful as much as Stefan is also hopeful for Ghana. Fantastic. So I think what we'll do now is get you all involved. Um, so the, the, the key thing is to press the button on the on the microphone so we can all hear you. And I guess if we, I see one question here, is yeah, another one there, one on this side. So let's start with the gentleman in the middle here. Okay, can I ask if, what do you think are the, are the long run lessons from the comparison between Indonesia and Nigeria? Both became independent about 60 years ago, both have lots of oil wealth, large 
very diverse communities. But if you look at simple measures like longevity, they are hugely different. But And they've had no charismatic people like Zanawi in Ethiopia and so on. So what's the explanation in Ethiopia? Could it be things like Pankasila, the sort of self-help society aware philosophy? I, or is that just, it seems naive to the outside observer, but I just wonder whether that has created a uh, feeling of um, awareness of the society consequences of your actions. So I'm going to just group these in three, if you don't mind, and then... And just to be clear, that was Indonesia... Uh, Nigeria. Yeah, Nigeria. It's, it's sort of Indonesia and Nigeria. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. The gentleman in the back here. Yep, you. Is the, is the mic on? Uh, it's supposed to turn around. Oh, right. exactly. Yeah, is that better? Yep. Yeah, so thank you both for that. That was, that was very insightful. Um, I think this is more aimed at, at Stefan because of your ex different and ex or current SCDO. Where do you think um, development finance institutions kind of fit into this, into the um, uh, development bargain? So not necessarily aid, but um, institutions that are kind of uh, aiming to tr build up uh, private sectors in, in these countries. Because I, I, a lot of money goes from like the II and from IFC goes to these countries that you don't think have a development bargain. Is that all just wasted at the moment? Thank you. And then one here and then you can, and, and Mona, feel free to jump in after we've had the three questions posed. I think it's all, okay. yeah, I think you have to hold it down, yeah. Like that? Is yeah. that okay? Perfect. Thank you so much, Stefan and Mona. That was really excellent. Um, firstly, just a quick question, Stefan. Do you have any examples of when a development bargain state uh, collapses and basically when the development bargain goes away, talks a lot about how they form and just curious about the kind of context there that we need to be on the lookout for. And then related to that, and I think particularly for you, Mona, I was curious, uh, you mentioned some of the challenges Ghana's facing now, particularly, you know, with inflation running just over 30%, I think, and, and some of the other challenges you're facing, and that's not unique to Ghana, I know around the world some real challenges. So I just want to ask, do you see you know, the potential to go to the IMF for an, a 17th time. Do you see that as kind of par for the course and that that's something that will be manageable or do you see any kind of broader concerns or, or threats emerging there? Thank you. Okay, in, in whichever order. Well, let Mona. Yeah, do you want to start, Mona? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, um, I'll start with the third question about Ghana, since that is current. Um, Actually, we are already at the point where the IMF team is in Ghana. Uh, it's a 10 day visit started last week. So we are in discussions because as it, were, it is, we are in debt distress. Um, I think sometimes the way we want to view debt puts us in, in certain situations that um, you almost need the IMF to come and tell you that you can't do it that way. Um, when, when, you have, when you take loans for projects and those projects have revenues attached to them, you can almost do it purely project-based and not apply sovereign guarantees to them. And then you can say that it's off balance sheet. But honestly, anything that has government guarantees or a sovereign guarantee is definitely part of your debt stock. So any way at all that you try to slice it, you are going to, in the end, have to add it all back. And when you thought you had a certain 78% debt to GDP, the IMF comes to town and you find out that you actually have somewhere 83% plus because they're adding everything in there. A supplier's credit, that has government guarantee is, is debt, is pure national debt, public debt. So um, unfortunately, a lot is coming out of the woodwork. Um, we are realizing that we won't make our growth rate. Our deficit is large because we have overspent and not on capital expenditure, not on projects that will return revenue. We still have a lot of infrastructure work to do for our roads, our ports, our railway, all those things that help us to, to be competitive in international trade, as Stefan described, all those things that keep us in good practice and good standing. 
And therefore, the IMF is here. We will have a conversation with them. Our debt stock is such that it used to be almost 50-50 in terms of external and internal. Now, it's a little more internal than external. So we have what we have control over is our domestic debt. And as you rightly said, inflation has gone up. Our city has depreciated. The central bank has increased the monetary policy rate several times. In fact, the last one was about 300 basis points again. So it's gone up about almost 950 basis points over the last two years. And it hasn't helped because of the fiscal dominance. So we are now looking at a situation where with that large stock of domestic debt, what can we do? Because that we can tackle immediately to even give external investors some confidence in our ability to manage our debt. Now, in 2016, when I was leaving office, we had a sinking fund, which was basically a debt service reserve account, where we put in a significant amount of money to take on repayments of bond uh, maturities. All that was spent during the COVID, during times when we had to import more than export. And today we don't have that. So we are having some serious debt um, issue. At, the, at this point in time, there's a debt sustainability assessment going on, and that will determine the kind of program that we'll go into with the IMF. Because as you know, with any program, you must be able to show that you can sustain your debt capacity going forward. So we'll have to show that. We'll have to show plans and commitments as to how we will raise revenue to reduce our deficit, be able to service our debt, and be able to pay off other um, commitments that we, we, we have. So um, there is no time like this one when Ghana is going to need more of the non-ruling elite, um, the CSOs and the media coming together to try and come out with a solution. And that is when we will commit to, to that bargain, you know, that bargaining commitment to make our nation, you know, get back to where it was in terms of when it was doing well. So those have been the challenges that Ghana is facing, facing now. We don't know what the solution will be but we're working through our debt sustainability assessment. And out of that, the IMF will help us to determine what kind of solutions. Um, domestic debt, we are going to have to be very careful because what we do with it will affect our financial institutions who hold a lot of those bills and bonds. What we do with it will affect our pensions and bottom line will affect all citizenry, the individuals, because a lot of Ghanaians love to save. And so they, a lot of them have bought bills and bonds, government bills and bonds. And what happens to those bonds will determine the future in terms of um, how we continue to save, how we continue to commit to development. So that is a situation in Ghana, which uh, we are trying to work through. Um, development finance institutions, I'm sure, Stefan, you, you will speak to that. But um, Ghana has continued to enjoy bilateral trades, multilateral trades with a lot of these development finance institutions. I won't name any of them, but all of them have helped us in many sectors, especially the energy sector where we were struggling. So that, the, the, that help has always been helpful, and we always look forward to getting that help. With respect to the Nigeria-Indonesia question, I'll leave that to Stefan, and I wouldn't want to comment on that. <coughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much, Mona. And also good to bring in the, the whole sort of COVID impact, which has made things more difficult. So let's now go to the step on to the other. Yeah, I just, just let, let's uh, do it. So like maybe first on all these development finance institutions, uh, there was the question, what to do? So, so basically this kind of uh, development companies that, that uh, invest in firms and, and so on. Now, you know, it's very clear. I mean, it, just in the framework of shifting the incentives again in favor of development, more development bargain and growth relative to the more odious ones, these institutions don't tend to invest most of the time in firms like deeply connected to government or something. You know, there's, and in fact, I, I, I was, uh, when I was giving a presentation at the World Bank, I said, you know, you should split your private sector department. You know, you should have a department of connected business and unconnected business because it's the unconnected business and of which typically are very small and quite non-existent 
are actually the ones that are not engaging in all the rent seeking and the whole thing. So you kind of need to do. So it's not just private sector is good uh, uh, in, in itself there. But, um, but the interesting thing is that, um, you know, when there is progress for growth there, um, you know, for a firm to come in and to commit capital in a place where it's not entirely clear whether they're actually going to go for growth or going to go for some kind of continuing mess, um, you know, there's clearly a case to de-risk that investment. What I find very striking is that I've known, and I will name them, the IFC being proudly saying that they have an investment in South Sudan. And I asked, what are you doing? Oh, we have a shopping mall where the, where the rich will go and shop. And I thought that probably doesn't set the right incentives in Juba for, for a bit more growth and development spending. Okay, so, so you want to have a lens of what are the business, what are the sectors here that can actually help to unlock it. And, you know, I find it striking how rarely development finance institutions invest in tradable industries. It's so much non-tradables. And non-tradables are by definition very much connected to the government. So if you have a, a, a relatively benign government as in Ghana, it's fine. But if you do that in Nigeria, you know, you're looking for trouble. You know, you're embedding more, more, the, more the mess that exists. So it's like, you know, it's an old fashioned thing, focus on tradables, but the political economy of tradables is very important here as well, because that's much harder, as I said earlier, to be connected to, to government and or, or at the whim of government. So anyway, so there's definitely something there that they could learn. Quickly on Indonesia and Nigeria. So oh, there's, there's, there's actually, I have a chapter on Indonesia and a chapter on Nigeria, and I make a bit of the comparison. People have used to make it, but I think the, the key here is, is I think the early 1970s, okay? Uh, there was actually not that much oil. We weren't clear about oil in, in Nigeria by then, really. But in the early 1970s, of course, there was the, the, the oil, but there was also Suharto coming to power. After, of course, having arguably lost all legitimacy with the old elite, because he had basically kicked out Sukarno, which was the embodiment of the old elite. Uh, at the same time, not with much legitimacy to the people, because he was the one, of course, one of the key people killing all the people in the countryside. So he had very low legitimacy, but he at least seemed to have understood that he needed to get legitimacy and he chose to do it actually to growth. Now, it was a tricky game, but he in the end condoned against a lot of protests that the Japanese investors came, the FDI came. And I think that was a key moment that Japanese investment came to Indonesia because that was the first one that actually, that they moved so far, so to speak, and not, not simply be in, in, uh, in, 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 in closer there to their neighborhood, they're actually doing it and investing it. And that was totally against the Sukarno, the, Su the Sukarno people, the Sukarnists or whatever they were called. So that was actually, they didn't like this. But he left then um, Petromina and all these companies in the hands of the old elite. So actually, it was a clever deal. And this is kind of controversial, maybe as the diagnosis, but he allowed the corruption to continue forever to allow the tradable industries to grow and actually create growth engines. But he probably needed to allow both of them to do it. Nigeria, I'm afraid, the deal meant never further than who controls the oil, who just controls the distributor thing. And so never was there a serious attempt, maybe a little bit with Obasanjo to decentralize at least some of the politics, but it's so limited decentralized that actually it's not really meaningful. So, you know, I think it's that game of, how do I create a space, a deal with the old elite that a new elite can emerge in growth? And that new elite, in the end, kicked Siddhartha himself out. So <laughs> it's, it's a striking thing that that actually led to the change after the Asian crisis. So it's agency at that moment doing a certain set of decisions. It's not just structures. It's not just the oil. It's not just the history. And I'm, you know, that's a very quick, quick and dirty way. And an, an, elite, an elite bargain, a development bargain that collapses, or Ethiopia, I had the worst time writing that chapter which is basically, I'm working on Ethiopia a lot. I spent a lot of time there. But of course, it was life-changing because if you think of it as the following, okay? It was the fastest growing economy or one of the fastest in the, in the world, 7% per capita growth, 2003, 2020. That's massive, okay? That's massive in per capita terms. Massive changes, poverty, halving, uh, infant mortality, child mortality, developmentally, you know, it was, it was not all with rising inequality, as you would say, though it was actually quite, quite inclusive. But it came about on the basis of an elite bargain where the political side was very, very limited. Whereas actually, 
you know, there was an elite bargain that never solved the fundamental question for Ethiopia, which meant that Ethiopia never had, a, only twice had a peaceful transition of power since the 18th century, because it's the national question, the different ethnicities, the different nationalities. So Ethiopia couldn't, and, and actually what Meles Zenawi did, charismatic leader as he was in a particular way, is a scary man as well, I used to know him, um, but, um, but what he did was actually gambling on the economy to create a legitimacy to keep enough power to actually do it. But actually, there was no rent distribution going on. And that, of course, brought the, the youth on the street and made the politics made to collapse. So actually, the development bargain is kind of collapsed because there was a quest for shorter term rents in a more complicated country that we could have actually kept together in this particular way. And so the future is likely to be much more rent distribution. Peace will mean more rent distribution and probably lower growth because that's not a development bargain that you could sustain in, in that sense, yeah. Excellent, so, um, and I guess another one, Myanmar. Because yes. <laughs> catastrophically, the IGC office opened 2012, yeah. closes 2021. 20, yes. Exactly, the gamble begins, the gamble ends, uh -huh. and, you know, fairly emphatic. But, but there, I would actually say it's actually been tried working a little bit with people there as well. The focus was too much on the political deal, and actually never thought of that the economy was still in the hands of the cronies. Mm. And, you know, at some point, if you don't bring them in, you won't sustain it. You need to, they should have done a bit of a suharto by a bit of compromise with some of the cronies to actually do it. It's a controversial statement, but, but, but you know, the economic deal couldn't keep it together. We have time probably for one more round of questions. Kunda, are there any questions from the from Zoom? Yes, yes, we do. Um, so I will start with, um, so we have a question from Alan Green. Um, the question is, to what extent is inequality within states a barrier to development? Would you agree that as inequality increases, so the elites tend to become more inclined to rely on the rentier economy than invest in productive business? Okay. Then we have another one from me, so, um, I think this is, I believe this is from IGC. Yep. Uh, he asks, what is the influence of external elite on development? I think the influence of imperialism and neocolonialism through multinational companies can lead to a situation where the local elite are led to protect themselves rather than the peace of their country. This happens with resource rich economies. Lack of peace breaks down institutions and opens the country up to exploitation by external elites, the case of the DRC. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So maybe one, is there maybe one more from here and then this gentleman here. So maybe just say who you are. And then... uh, my name is Christian. I work uh, at the IGC. Um, I have a question about, um, you said that uh, there needs to be an incentive for elites to, to change the status quo. And I guess often it's about a matter of wealth. Like if you change the system, then the elites lose out on wealth. But I guess sometimes it's also a matter of security. So looking at the example of maybe Syria and the SAP, if, um, if the elite um, give away power, that puts them at a risk. So I was wondering how, at a, at a risk of bodily harm, so I was wondering how you can move from this kind of bad equilibrium in which they find themselves to an equilibrium where um, maybe they they take that to take that gamble. So I think we'll you know, maybe. Uh, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'll, I'll I'll try to go go quick quick on these. Um, so so on the last one. Um, so um, you know, yeah. So it. It's why the, the gamble for Assad didn't make much sense. Of course, it wasn't a development, but it was an elite bargain really on control. You know, the you know, once you opened it up, they would they would lose. And given that there were pretty brutal <laughs> brutality would follow as well. I, I, I can't help but having an anecdote. Why Nations Fail was written or came out just around the Arab Spring. And I remember Jim Robinson endlessly touring the Middle East and saying, Oh, well, this is your moment, this is your moment. But it's it actually the Arab Spring is makes me very cautious to see these uprisings from below because elite capture will be there as well because it's the security. So so yeah, I, I think you've given another reason why elites may not want to change 
you know, the control is, is an important part of it. Um, it links a bit maybe also with, um, um, maybe, okay, so then the final point on that is that, you know, to make the general statement that you made, you know, the way wealth and inequality and things will interact, I would say, you know, it's going to depend very much on the local context and how we actually then think through it, uh, how that is happening. The, the point on um, the role of inequality, so, um, so, so, so there is something here that, you know, I'm talking very much, I'm describing here very much people at the moment of, 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 of takeoff, you know? So at the moments of takeoff, inequality is actually almost not an issue. It's almost not an issue. I simply want to say, you know, the, 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 the focus on extreme poverty is the, is the clearest indicator. It almost comes together in it. And, and what I'm trying to actually say is that, um, you know, the, the, um, as a, in terms of a, when, when there is growth emerging and people often concerns, oh, well, the inequality is growing and will it actually stop? You know, one of the striking things we have is that the, that the perceptions of inequality are especially strong when there is stagnation. But often growth, growth often not always, by no means, in fact, on average, probably not all, um, almost, um, 50-50 kind of chance where the inequality will increase, but when there's growth, there's usually very few complaints about inequality in people's minds. And so, so that actually means is that inequality plays a role often at these moments, these catalytic moments. You know, when there is stagnation, there is inequality, then it becomes again, and I'm linking it a bit with that other question of that kind of moment of, of stagnation. You know, is that the inequality creates the pressures the elites may have to be legitimized themselves. And actually the only way they can legitimize themselves is not by distribution, because that's not in their nature, it's actually through growth. And so you get the inequality pressurizing on that moment of change. But, but I'm, I'm reluctant to have this kind of, you know, a relative indicators, always I find a little bit hard to, 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 to help to describe takeoff moments, okay? So, the, the, the relative indicates. I don't give a very good answer, but afterwards come back and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk, talk, uh, talk a bit more about that. And then external elites. So, so it's an interesting one. Eh? So, so with most things where it's something to do with outsiders, it takes two to tango. So you need some insiders that want to, 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 to tango with the outsiders here. And whether it's about development bargaining countries with eight organizations, you know, they can, that can work because they may want to do the same thing. Similarly, elites that are um, that are very much on extraction and on on on, on controlling their the rents, they love the kind of FDI that tends to go to the DRC. You know, this is, you know, you and I'm not trying to talk up now BP or something or Shell, but you won't easily find them in the DRC. You know, the the, the explorers they have funky names. Yes, they're all listed in London, but they still have funky names that that uh, that they are working with particular type of things. So external leads do it of a very particular type. I mean, when I said illicit finance, this is the guys that also you can target. You know, this is the ones with with really going after illicit finance. You can break these contracts. You know, the the DRC contracts only exist because of illicit finance. That's no other way why they, why they exist. So, so yes, there is thing, but I mean, the kind of companies that do the deals in, in some in the DRC, it's not the same as saying, oh, that's neo-colonial. This is, this is, this, it, it, it's a bit more complicated. I, I was more going to think of slightly different way of neo-colonial. In fact, some close friend who's very senior in the, in the IMF, and I will not name his name, get him in trouble. He would say, well, sometimes in countries, we may actually have an elite bargain with the elites that we just stabilize the economy because that's in the interest of the, of the elite as well. A stable macroeconomy and no growth is in the interest of the elite. So actually there are countries that are saying maybe the IMF and the way they work with it could be an impediment to growth as well because as an external elite, you just make a little deal for stability. Everybody is happy, but there is no growth. So you, you, it can play in all kinds of ways. So, so there is, uh, you know, the IMF can be the, the, the good guys, but actually these international organizations and the way we work with these countries, we, we may embed the elites as well. Uh, you know, anything we do with Nigeria, I think as World Bank, as DFID, as uh, the IMF, we've embedded the elite further. 
and so we should not 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 uh, underestimate that. Fantastic. So, uh, Mona, any final? Yeah. Final? yeah to, to hazard an answer over and above what Stefan has said, the questions were difficult ones, but um, I'll, I'll just try and give some um, comments that I think answers a, a lot of them. So speaking about internal elites and inequality, I mean, we all know that the ruling elite decides where resources will go. They distribute the resources and where it will go. During propaganda time, we hear them say to be equally distributed, I mean, even when it doesn't make sense um, that they will put factories in places where there's no electricity and no water and all that. However, what we've realized over time, and especially during our revolution in Ghana, is that now most people have a voice, especially the, the downtrodden have a voice. And who are those? Those are crop farmers, our subsistence farmers. They now have a voice and they found ways of channeling their grievances to the ruling party. They found ways of saying that, listen, I'm watching you and if I don't get some of that resource so that I can grow, when election time comes around, I'll decide where my thumb will go. And that has given them some power, that electoral power, that they've been able to use that to pull development into their areas, which hitherto would not have had anything. So actually democracy after our revolution has worked quite well in, in smoothing out that inequality. Of course it is still there, uh, but it smoothened it out. Again, the revolution has also allowed the media, the fourth estate to grow very strongly in, in speaking to inequality. So internally the media has become a big elite group. The CSOs have grown and right now we cannot ignore them. They let us know uh, their mind, they explain so well to the general populace that they get the general populace thinking and realizing what the ruling elite is doing and they're able to query them. And sometimes we see peaceful demonstrations and so forth. So that awareness is rising very strongly. With um, Again, we are seeing the youth becoming very powerful. And we all know that the ruling party or the ruling elite do want some peace to do what they have to do, whatever it is, good or bad. And without getting the buy-in of the youth, they have a major problem. So unemployment amongst the youth is a big issue that most governments in Ghana, most ruling elites try to resolve and are working on. It's not resolved yet, but we do see some effort in that direction. To do with the external elite, for us, it's mainly the, um, the, the credit rating agencies at this time. And it's because a lot of our financing debt, our budget financing debt is from the Euro bond market. And therefore the credit rating agencies keep us on our toes. They remind us when we are going off track, they let the ruling um, elite know, even the non-ruling elite, they let them know. Um, I mean, we've, we've known businessmen who've been told that they are no longer allowed to get contracts because they are not in the good books of whether the World Bank or the IMF because of poor practices. So, um, and, and I've heard of that also in Liberia. So that kind of check has been good from the assets where external elite. So I, I guess who pays the piper calls the tune. So as we go out for more external financing, the rating agencies and the financial institutions that give us funding also act as a check or as a, a sort of elite to influence what we do in our policies. Recently, we opened up our domestic markets to foreign investors. So they bought a lot of our uh, bills and bonds, government bills and bonds. Therefore, they have also influenced what we do and what we don't do. I mean, today, as we think of what to do with that domestic debt, how it will impact them and the signals that will be sent into the international market is something that will guide our, our solutions and whatever um, resolutions we come up with. So I think we are influenced heavily by external elites, internal elites as well, and some of them being people that we never thought would be influencers, but today are influencers because of the democratic governance that we practice in Ghana. 
Thank you very much. And, and thank you. I think we should um, close things now. But Mona, thank you for a very eloquent description of the intricacies of you know, holding on to the gamble in, uh, in, 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 in Ghana. And also just for everyone here, I think uh, Stefan, I think, is happy to talk to people afterwards sure. and, and very importantly to buy his book, which is um, outside. And if you can all fill in a survey, which uh, somehow will reach you. Um, but just a, fi a final word, I think having seen places like Bihar and various countries like Uganda, what's happened in the last 15 years, say, it's just astonishing what 10% or 5% growth means relative to 1% or 0.5% or negative 1%. It's literally the difference between you being better off than your parents, uh, which, you know, even in uh, the West is becoming. And so, you know, I'm increasingly working in the environmental space and you meet a lot of people saying degrowth. Unfortunately, in many of the countries and indeed all the countries that Stefan is describing, the, the value of growth in terms of changing people's lives is so powerful that I think it's been a kind of wonderful to sort of hear this new insight and how that growth process can be started and maintained and how difficult it is to do that, that it's not something which you start and then assume is going to continue. There's this constant thing which Mona has been talking about of different groups into interacting with one another to maintain the gamble or not, as in the case of uh, Myanmar and Ethiopia. Anyway, thank you all for coming. And as I said, I think Stefan's happy to talk to others afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Just shoot off because I've got children to feel. Children, children.